Welcome to Insights into Northeast Michigan, a WBKB News public affairs program. Insights deals with the issues affecting those within the community, as well as Northeast Michigan and the state. And now, Insights into Northeast Michigan. Welcome to Insights, I'm Sherry Stewart. Today we have a look for you at how the pandemic is impacting the social and financial well-being of women. A report from the National Women's Law Center says that women lost 156,000 jobs overall during December, while men gained 16,000 jobs. According to the Law Center's analysis, that means that 100% of all U.S. jobs lost in December were jobs held by women. Today, we'll take a look at some of the policies that may help improve that stat for women. And we'll also talk to women who are wearing multiple hats in their families and communities to help get through this pandemic. Well, joining us to kick off the conversation is Dr. Louise Jazerski. She is an associate professor of social relations and policy and comparative cultures and politics at James Madison College at Michigan State University. Dr. Jazerski, thank you for spending time with us today. Thank you very much, Sherry. Happy to be with you. Absolutely. Well, we have a lot of stats to, to break down, and I know you have pulled some for Alpena specifically. Uh, but first, I want to take a look at this. The National Women's Law Center uh, issued a report not too long ago that uh, found that 100% uh, of the jobs lost uh, by the U.S. economy in December, those were jobs that were held by women. And even as early as uh, April of 2020, the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics found that uh, women accounted for 55% of the unemployed compared to 13% unemployment rate for men. So some startling numbers as it relates to women and this pandemic. So when you hear those numbers, doctor, is it as simple as just facts or do we need to take a look at some policies that are really impacting um, how this pandemic is uh, wreaking havoc on the financial lives of women? Well, I think policies are important, but it's important to understand what policies to apply given the nature of the problem in the first place. The problem in the first place is the kinds of jobs women hold. It's the, it's the sectors of the economy that women have been employed in and where their job growth has been uh, the most substantial. So women have been employed in education, in personal services, especially in food services and in retail. And all of those have been uh, severely hit by the pandemic, especially since April. So we're thinking about restaurants closing, uh, people not going to the stores that are, um, you know, in substantial buildings, but going to Amazon instead. Right. All of those retail workers are losing their jobs. Some of this is you know, long-term structural. So the rise in women in the education sector has been a good thing. Women are going to uh, finishing high school, they're going to get associate's degrees, they're going to get college degrees, especially white women. And those sectors have increased. Um, but of course, with the pandemic, all of those kinds of things have closed. Not just teachers, but people who work in um, support services in schools, a lot of classroom assistants, for example. So in the education sector, which is a traditionally strong sector for women, that's been affected by the, by the pandemic. And um, I'm especially concerned about teachers. We know that there's been some school strikes around the country, most notably Chicago, where teachers unions just don't wanna go back to work until they think it's safe. Luckily in Michigan, teachers are considered essential workers and they're getting COVID vaccine shots. Mm -hmm. And that might uh, speed up the fact that our classrooms might be able to open in person more uh, quickly. Yeah, I know that uh, staff, the administrators are certainly hopeful. So let's take a look at some of those stats, doctor, that you pulled for um, Alpena specifically. How are women faring in this region? Well, I have some of the most recent statistics for um, different sectors in Michigan, 17 sectors in Michigan. And this comes from Michigan.gov uh, Regional Unemployment Statistics, Department of Technology Management and Budget. They don't have it pulled out by sector or by uh, sex, but we do know, and this was just, um, ju this was just released, 
that unemployment went up in every of the every one of the 17 regions of Michigan. Every single one. Um, rates jumped from three to seven point five percent percentage points in unemployment. When you take a look at, um, and I know you've done a lot of policy research, so let's get into some of the research that you're doing. What potentially is uh, an answer? Uh, is it as simple as uh, trying to segue women into um, higher paying fields, say, for example, the STEM programs, after school programs, those types of works? Or is it um, child, uh, child tax credit? What, what actually are the policies that could be put in place to help women? The best overall policies for families in general and especially for women is child tax credits mm -hmm. or straight up not ta tax credits but as they're talking about just this past weekend both the republican side that romney has proposed in the senate mm -hmm. and in the democratic side just advanced cash payments to families up to three thousand dollars for families with per child mm -hmm. uh for families that are making half of the unemployed half of the uh poverty threshold mm -hmm. And then that would be gradually changed. Right. Just helping women month to month, rather than, for example, earned income tax credit. You get a tax credit, you know, once you file your taxes, usually March or April. That comes in one lump sum. But this monthly payment would go back to sort of the old sort of file of so old, sorry, the old fashioned uh, welfare of just giving people money for for helping their, with their children. Now, there's some discussion about it, extra money for childcare, mm -hmm. which we don't supply. Um, but you can, with this extra income, monthly income, pay for some childcare. And that's been a huge problem for women in un unemployment. It's not just that, co that COVID closed a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. It's also that as schools closed, Women were the ones that had to drop out of the labor force to take care of children. We still know that women do an extra month of work compared to the men in the household. And if there are children at home, those women have been the most affected by the pandemic crisis. So until schools open, women can't get back to their jobs. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Give vaccines to teachers, open those classrooms up, and get kids back in the classroom. And that will help women especially. I mean... If you don't have childcare, these women are doing double duty at home, and it's just been crushing for women, crushing. Right. And I, both anecdotally and we know from a lot of stories around um, not just the United States, but elsewhere too. Mm -hmm. And in the time we have remaining, Doctor, talk just a little bit about the research that you're doing. We have just about a minute left. Sure, we noticed this problem. So we're looking at how women find work in the informal economy given mm -hmm. COVID. How do women find babysitters? How do women find housekeeping jobs? How do women who need extra health uh, child care at home find women who can do those kinds of things? So we're looking both in in-depth interviews and in uh, survey work, which is just starting, we don't have any data yet, to look at how the closure of schools, the closure of churches, the closure of, closure of other kinds of clubs affect how women find work and how women find other women to work with them in household duties. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, I'm sure that will be some interesting research. Dr. Jazerski, we want to thank you for spending a time with us and kicking off the conversation today. Thanks very much for having me. Well, there's more of insights coming up after the break. When we come back, we'll be joined by a woman who's wearing several hats. She is an attorney, she is a single mom, and she is also a family counselor. That's coming up next. Insights will return after these messages. Welcome back to Insights. Joining me now to pick up the conversation is attorney Sabrina Shaheen Cronin. She's wearing several hats as an attorney, also a single mom, and also a family coach. So Sabrina, welcome to the show today and thank you for spending time with us. Thank you so much for having me, Sherry. It's an honor to be here. Oh, absolutely. Well, earlier, uh, Sabrina, we were talking uh, with a professor from Michigan State University about the financial impact uh, that the pandemic is having on women, but you also serving as a family coach. What are some of the tips that you can give uh, women? And I guess men too, men are also doing heavy lifting through this whole process, but what are some of the tips that you have for people that are trying to maneuver this space? They have kids at home, they're also having to work, um, what would you recommend? 
you know, Sherry, it's difficult and it changes for everybody. Everybody has, you know, her own needs and things that she needs to do to, you know, stay healthy and stay focused. And I say she, and like you said, men have experienced a lot of the stress as well, but women actually have the unemployment rate for women has skyrocketed as compared to men. And I think it's because typically the women are more on the, the front lines in the, in the services industries that have lost their jobs, been unemployed, and they also are catering to the stay-at-home children uh, who have to go to school virtually. And, you know, let's face it, women are typically the caretakers and the caregivers, and they are the ones that have to either resign from their jobs or, you know, um, get the unemployment to be at home, to raise the children, to help them with school. And uh, they are the ones that have the highest unemployment, unemployment rate, almost four to, to one now at this point. Yeah, and I know Sabrina that you're downstate, and I'm familiar with that area where your where your uh, where your offices are. What are you seeing uh, in that area? Is there anything specific to uh, to to your area that you're seeing in terms of women being impacted? I know we talked earlier about Northeast Michigan, but your area specifically. Well, in in Bloomfield Hills, there has been an increase actually in domestic violence, unfortunately, uh, with more and more people at home, and the stresses are high. And there is actually a rise of alcoholism during the stay-at-home period. There has been an uptick in, you know, very high conflict cases. There has been an uptick in women losing their jobs. There has been an up uptick in the unemployment rate as well. And we do have more children at home learning virtually. And that is tough as well. And, and those women who are trying to balance both a career or job, if it's just a job for them and not their career, but, but you know, they need to earn an income for their children, especially those that are single. And so whether it's a job or a full-fledged career, it's a ton of stress on these women and they're being pulled in so many different directions, wearing a million different hats. And it's, it's a tough time for everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and then you, um, as a family coach, what are some of the, the coaching tools or mechanisms that you uh, give people so that they can actually maneuver this stressful space? Well, and I think, Sherry, that this goes for both men and women and children, for that matter. We have seen that the many of these fallouts from this pandemic truly have caused a great deal of concern. We have mental illness on the rise. We have you know, physical impairments on the rise and people really need to look at their daily rituals. What gets them going every day? Is it maybe a little bit of meditation? Is it taking a walk around the block? Is it just trying to excuse yourself to another room of the house so you don't lose it on your kids when you're trying to work and help them with virtual learning at the same time? You know, If you're sharing a computer, that's always tough. So make sure you're eating well, getting plenty of rest because we know that, you know, when we're not sleeping well or eating well and not taking care of ourselves in those areas, everything else can kind of feel the impact even more. And stress is a huge, huge factor on our well-being, both emotionally and physically. So take care of yourself, try to limit the amount of alcohol, try to be grateful, wake up every morning with, you know, some gratitude. Instead of being depressed or watching the news every morning, look at something else that makes you, you know, happy. There's actually some scientific studies that show that if you watch a comedian at night before bed instead of the news, you'll be happier. Play some happy music. There's also a study that says listening to Pharrell Williams' happy song every morning makes you happier. So do that. Get yourself motivated. Listen to things that feed your soul instead of take away. And if you find you're getting stressed out watching the news, then don't. If you find you're getting stressed out thinking about certain things, change your thought. It's that instant. Any kind of action that you're taking that might not be good for you, think of the thought that you're thinking right before that action and change the thought. It's that simple and it's a choice, but you have to be disciplined to make those choices and to change those thoughts. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting that you say we don't even think about it, but something as simple as having to share the laptop computer or maybe the only computer in the home with your children that have to be online. And if you're, you know, having to work from home, then that obviously is another challenge. I had to do that at the beginning of the pandemic, last, you know, the end of the winter time in the spring, 
I was sharing my computer that I had to do Zoom hearings with for court with my younger son. And I'm, it was, it was stressful. I'm not going to lie. I mean, dealing with his schooling and then dealing with court hearings and trying to upload his work assignments and have him be on his Zoom classes. And it was tough to say the least. So I feel you all, it's not easy, but try, try with all your heart and might to just take the time to be positive because it takes just as much energy to be negative as it does to be positive. And know that this too shall pass. It's a moment in time and just know that you can get through this. Mm -hmm. Well, and the time that we do have remaining, Sabrina, what is the, I guess, the one step, you've given us a couple different tools that we can add to our toolbox, but what is the, the one step, the one immediate thing that you think that we could all uh, focus on, men and women, uh, to start uh, being, become more disciplined so that we can make sure that our days are as stress-free stress -free as we can possibly make them? Well, I think, Sherry, that you need to realize that this will, this is a moment in time. And the, the first thing you should do is just be grateful. Be grateful that you have a roof over your head. Be grateful that you have a healthy, happy family. Be grateful if you are at home, that you have that extra time with your kids, even though you might not like it so much because it's stressful, you're never gonna get this time back. So enjoy the extra time you have at home instead of all the hustle and bustle and enjoy those moments. and you know, enjoy some of the peace and solitude that you have. Again, this is a moment in time and the hustle and bustle will come back swinging next year, I know for a fact. So, well, let's hope, anyway, I don't know for a fact, but I'm thinking that's where we're gonna be next year. So we have nowhere else to go, but be grateful for what we have because it doesn't help us to be negative. It's only hurting you. Okay, well, and I think that's a great place to leave it, uh, starting the day with a, the spirit of gratitude. That's one of the first things that we can do to take uh, more ownership of the day and to alleviate some of that stress. Gratitude and kindness, it gets us through everything. Absolutely, that will certainly take you far. Sabrina, I wanna thank you for spending time with us today and uh, sharing those nuggets of how to uh, maneuver uh, this pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sherry. Have a great day. Insights will return after these messages. Welcome back to Insights. We're continuing our conversation today about the impact of this pandemic on the social and financial well-being of women. And joining me now to kick off this segment is Carmen Sutherland and her parents, Benita and Jerome Sims. I want to welcome you all to the show today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. And I will mention that, Carmen, you are based in Michigan while mom and dad are enjoying some time in Arizona. Exactly. Well, Carmen, this whole day we've been talking about the extra heavy lifting that women have undertaken during this pandemic. But for you, it took the form of actually uh, taking the lead and investigating how your parents could become, uh, get the COVID-19 vaccine. And I will mention that you also wrote about this in an article that appeared on CNN. And in that article, you say that your parents were fairly computer savvy. So walk me through why you felt it's so important for you to take the lead in making sure that they actually got this vaccine? What did you discover um, in your process of investigating this for your parents? Yeah, I mean, it was really important. You know, we lost one of my dad's sisters um, this, this winter to COVID, my aunt Dolores. And so, you know, it really hit close to home. I've known a lot of people with COVID, obviously, but she was the first one that was really closest to us that we lost. And so, we, you know, we're still missing her and healing from that. Um, and as I started to hear more about the vaccine and the rollout and what the opportunities were, for parents, or for my parents and people in their age group in Arizona, I wanted to make sure that, you know, I did all I could to support them and making sure they got the first appointment that when it was available. Um, and, you know, I know from, you know, what I've even heard here locally about some of the challenges and, and lack of having vaccines that it was just, you know, going to be a, a pretty hard, hard lift. And so starting first thing in the morning when I'm on the East, Eastern, you know, East Coast time and they weren't being able to get on first thing as soon as the lines, the, uh, the website open and having my dad set up kind of his profile in advance. So just being prepared to do what I needed to do to get an appointment um, and not have them really navigate those online systems 
um, I think just made things easier for them and made me also more comfortable that things were done in the best way that they could have been done. Mr. and Mrs. Sims, this is for you and either of you can answer. So you've had your first dose of the vaccine, is that right? Correct. Okay, and what was that process like as you were going in to get the vaccine? Have you experienced any side effects? What have you felt like since you've gone through the first, I guess, step in this process? Well, I was surprisingly pleased that we went to the um, State Farm Arena for our uh, vaccine, and it was very well organized, and you didn't have to get out of your car. My husband has some challenges with mobility, and so to be able to go through a drive-through setting was uh, very uh, appropriate for older people. Mm -hmm. uh, side effects, um, extremely minimal, even though we had heard many stories that uh, gave us pause that we might have um, some significant effects, but neither of us experienced that mm -hmm. with our first uh, vaccine shot. And Mr. Sims, to you, did you have any apprehension at all? Were you, you know, kind of agitated? Any apprehension about going, uh, going ahead and get the vac vaccine? Well, when the vaccine first came out, we were, <laughs> but uh, we settled our man into uh, even the best to have the vaccine and not to have it. And, and then Carmen, I know that you wrote in your article on CNN that at least at that point, you hadn't seen your parents physically for at least 14 months. That's a long time. And you're like a lot of adult uh, children that are taking those extra precautions uh, to make sure that you keep uh, your family safe. So what message do you have uh, for, for people that are actually navigating this space? Just don't give up. You know, I talked to a colleague today and she's been trying for her dad um, in Macomb County and their system is a bit different where it's not online. It's a lot of calling and she's trying to get an appointment and he also doesn't want to drive very far. So he's not super accommodating as well. But whatever you need to do, if it's driving 50 miles to get to your nearest pharmacy, the pharmacy that has vaccines or it's, you know, being up early to be online to to make that phone call or get that appointment to, you know, sometimes even, I mean, I would venture to say in some cases showing up, if you're, re if you really want to get it, you try everything that you can to make sure that your loved ones are protected. So keep trying. And, and this is to either of you. Um, what have you learned about, um, I guess, our medical system, anything new? Because obviously in the African-American community, there is some apprehension about vaccines just because of the historical mistreatment um, at times in the medical uh, community. So what have we learned? Um, do you have a message for people that are maybe sitting on the fence and that are apprehensive about moving forward with getting the vaccine? Well, I spoke to my 92-year-old uh, sister in Detroit, and she was somewhat apprehensive as far as going to a vaccine center, most of them going to her own doctor office. So I called her Sunday and told her, I, I called her to scold her, you know, because she can't wait for a doctor to get the vaccine. Because my other sisters, two of them, had got it, the vaccine the day before. And I told her, you know, that she couldn't wait, she gotta go to the first place available. I said, I don't want to school you because you, 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 you're my big sister, but I'm calling to school you. Mm -hmm. So she called back the next day, it's okay, I don't like being in school, so I made my appointment. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she has two appointments coming up too. So do you have to get the second dose? Are you waiting to get the second dose? We're now scheduled for next week. So we'll have our second uh, uh, vaccine next week on the 17th. But we weren't, we weren't ever notified as far as the timeline for the second vaccine. And my wife called and couldn't get any response. So the next day I called and they transferred me to another party and uh, they were able to set us up for the second vaccine, which is on the 17th of this month. So you do have to be persistent, you know, and we felt pretty good that we were able to negotiate that ourselves. <laughs> that's very good. Well, that's about, well, she described you as being fairly computer savvy, so uh, that's really good. So guys, we are just about, we are out of time today, but I want to thank you all for sharing that story. Glad to know that you are uh, almost done with this process and uh, we'll be looking to see the grandkids and uh, seeing your family face-to-face. -face. It's nothing like that face-to-face -face connection. So um, happy to hear this story so i want to thank you for spending time with us today and sharing your sharing your good news
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all we have for you this week. If you have a question, comment, or story idea, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at news at WBKB11.com. I'm Sherry Stewart. Thank you again for watching and have a great week. Insights into Northeast Michigan is produced by WBKB News. This has been a production of Thunder Bay Broadcasting Corporation. All rights reserved.